Hi, this is Sydney with Social Justice Connection. And today I am joined by Shino Wadon for a conversation on intersectionality as an approach to discrimination in our workplaces. Sheena, thank you for joining us. Would you like to tell us about yourself? Absolutely. It's a pleasure to be here with you, Sydney. My name is Sheena Wadhawan. I am a consultant, facilitator, and coach for organizations, specifically specializing in sort of feminist and anti-racist organizations. Um, but before that, I come from a long history of being a social justice attorney um, here in the U.S. for many years and worked in movements for immigrants' rights, tenants' rights, workers' rights, um, and, and the rights of women and children. So I've spent a lot of time doing um, human rights work, and I know that Social Justice Connection, that is your value. It's, it's a, a pleasure to be here with you today. Wonderful. And again, thank you. Um, now, tell us, what does intersectionality mean to you, um, both in theory and practice? Absolutely. Well, for sure, in theory, you know, from the theoretical perspective, all credit goes to Ms. Kimberly Crenshaw, who coined the term. Um, and, and I think that most folks are now familiar with the definition and, and what her analysis came from. And actually, when people still do this exercise of asking sort of crowds to say whether they recognize like names of, for example, black men killed by police, you'll see sort of a lot of hands go up, which is something very unique to our time right now, at least people know. But when they say the names of black women, the hands are much less, markedly less still now. So I think that what Ms. Crenshaw was talking about then is still very much relevant now. Um, and we're still catching up, right? So intersectionality from a theoretical perspective is really understanding the intersections of our identity. I'm not just an immigrant in the US. I'm not just a brown girl. I'm also a woman. I'm also a mother, you know, so I have all the intersections of my identity come together and, and you can only truly understand and be aware and then create a workplace, say, that is going to be inclusive for, for me if you understand the intersectionality of my identities. So from a theoretical perspective and sort of for the topic of the day, that's the relevance, I think. Um, as a practical matter, what it's always meant to me is, you know, I'm in my mid-30s and so... I just say that as a marker of my experience coming up and my experience of feminism was very much a white feminism um, and not a feminism I could relate to or see my place in. They weren't my issues. They didn't care about me. It wasn't inclusive to people like me. Um, intersectional feminism is. It very markedly is basically, it's a feminism that I'm included in, that I'm considered in, um, that is not just elite um, university educated white women. Why is this concept of intersectionality and its approach absolutely necessary for a healthy workplace? Oh God, so many ways. So I work now with workplaces and that's the central concern for my clients, right? And when we look at what's going on, whatever is sort of the symptom of their root problem, um, whether it's a lot of turnover or staff morale being low or straight up climate surveys that indicate that people feel it's a very racist or oppressive, sexist workplace. We really look at when you start digging in with people one-on-one, -on -one, it is of course all about the intersections of the identities. That's the, the core of what people's experience are. A, a, a man of color may be having a really different experience in a certain workplace where there's a lot of sexism, say, um, or bias against women than, than women of color in that organization. And the same goes for queer and trans folk. You know, I think we, um, workplaces are still largely cisgendered. Uh, and so we don't even, I think, often spend much time thinking about or being aware of all the ways in which we are so privileged uh, to just be cisgendered and in our appearance and in what we wear. And when you're taking an intersectional approach, you're actually going to think about in great detail, what does it mean to be, to be trans and, and all the burden, all the stress that someone goes through, for example, before they even walk in the door, how are they going to present that day? What are they going to wear? What happened at the coffee shop? What names did people call them? What bathroom could they use at the train station? Right? 
And like, we need to be able to understand everything that folks go through in their regular days before they even walk in the doors of their office. Um, and we need to be able to truly hold that space for folks and then be conscious of what are the ways in which we are maybe unconsciously, maybe implicitly reinforcing those biases and that um, privileged structure that favors a majority. Okay, and um, in kind of being conscious and holding these spaces open for the various identities we present, how would you advise um, someone be a better advocate and ally to those experiencing various systems of oppression? Cindy, I love this question uh, because there's so much to say, but I'm, I'm gonna boil it down for, for ease in this, in this format, which is, I think first of all, what I think any workplace manager leader should ask themselves is, do we have a plan? Is it in our goals? Right, like if an organization hasn't planned for it, it's not in their goals, they're definitely not on their way there, right? And I think that it's also a very um, practical way of looking at what is the organization's actual commitment to that. Say we call it diversity and inclusion, say you call it anti oppression, you know, whatever your language that you're using for this. To, to have a workplace that's truly inclusive. Are you planning for it? Is it in your goals? So that's one. Number two is, is it resourced? And by resourced, I mean, look at your budget, the line, what number is next to it? And what I often say to clients is, well, let's look at your budget line for your tech person. Let's look at your budget line for your janitor, right? for your janitorial services, for your cleaning. And then let's look at your line item for diversity and inclusion. Does it match? Where is it? Less or more? And then we can talk about, oh, okay, so is this less important than having a clean bathroom or more important than having a clean bathroom? Is it less important than having working tech or more? Right? So I think that's a really concrete way to bring it home. And here's the deal. I see over and over large, well-resourced corporations having volunteer committees for diversity and inclusion. And what I always say to them is, if you had your bathrooms cleaned by a volunteer committee of staff, how clean would those bathrooms be? Would those be acceptable to you on Monday morning? <laughs> I'm guessing no. So where are the resources? And there's so many amazing consultants, trainers, materials, resources out there now. There's no reason for any organization to struggle or try to reinvent the wheel. It's out there, just resource it, bring it in. You don't have the expertise in house, don't be using your regular staff as volunteers and expecting them to have that really specific expertise, resource it, bring it in. Um, so that's second. And then third is, is it part of your process? You know, at every decision point from where you throw your happy hours to your onboarding, to your hiring, which is usually, you know, the, the commonplace people do notice it, is in hiring and recruitment. But what about onboarding? What about literally the way your office looks? How, what, how are your bathrooms designated? Where do you have your happy hours? Are you always going to an Irish pub? You know, there are things, there's all these subtle ways in which we reinforce a culture of whiteness, frankly, and cis heteronormativity. And we can truly look at that, but is it part of your process? It should always be on the checklist. As you're going down, you know, you always think about who you're inviting, budget, optics, boom. What about inclusion? And as, long, as, as you make that a regular part of your process, it, it's not more work, right? It just becomes part of your, the way that you look at things. And it allows for a really natural space for folks to speak up, right? So that now I, as a woman of color, if I notice that, that something discriminatory is happening or something that's having a disparate impact, I, I don't have to go out of a regular process to say something and take all that additional burden and risk to myself and my career and be that you know angry brown girl. There's just a regular part of the process where everyone is to chime in on that issue and it shows that an organization really is taking it seriously. Okay, thank you. That was an amazing, amazing answer. <laughs> Um, so do you have any closing thoughts? 
I just will say I do this work with my whole heart because I spent a lot of time in nonprofits who are supposed to be the organizations who are dismantling oppression. And I will tell you that they unwittingly or wittingly participated in that very same oppression. Um, and, and it's so sad because I think that we can better serve our communities and better use the resources that we do have to do good when we are doing this inner work. And, and, and one really important point is, and I think this cannot be said more loudly, is with respect to being a good ally, what folks need to do, absolutely need to do, white folks, allies, cisgendered folks, they need to do their own inner work. And that means really inner looking at the ways in which we all participate in in, in bias, in, 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 in institutions of oppression, the way in which we've internalized those majority structures and not in a way of blame, but in a way of really healing and a commitment to transformation. And until we transform ourselves and can really look within, we're not gonna be able to make that systemic change that's really needed. And I know that there's a real thirst for. So um, get that help and those resources, they're out there to do that personal transformation work, get that support to do it um, and do it in a way that's really healing and meaningful and builds you up instead of sort of breaking you down. And then it can be um, just those healthy transformations that happen. And I can tell you from experience, I've seen it with my own eyes, it's absolutely possible and it, it's really not that hard. All right, thank you so much. Um, so generally kind of acknowledging your own privilege and your own faults and biases internally and coming out as a better person for it and bringing that into the world. Absolutely. Look within and then look at the systems in place. Take them one at a time and resource it. Resource it, resource it, resource it. I love it. I love it. It's an amazing <laughs> Um, I can truly see why you have been referred to as a doula for social organizations and 